Thank you, everyone who's watching um, from their offices, on their computers, and at home. We've had over 1,000 people tuning in, which is great, because I think we could all agree that this has been some of the most significant matter, if you will, in science language, content that any of us have really heard in a long time. So please give yourselves a round of applause again, our semifinalists and the information discussion. Thank you again to our friend Ryan Craig. Uh, there is a book, Apprentice Nation, for all of our semis. Um, as you leave today, I just want to make a comment before we get to the last panel, one of my favorite subjects about why we stop for education, um, that the issue, as you all talked about before, and as I know so many in this room understand and practice every day, it shouldn't about either or, college or career, it should be about higher education and defining higher education in any way that gets a student, an individual, an adult to the pathway that's gonna be valuable, make them productive and happy citizens, which is why we stop for education. So, my final panel, I'm so happy to have you guys up here. I'm just gonna throw out some questions and let's have a conversation about what it means. You know, when Janine uh, and I first started working together on what was originally the STOP Foundation and it had become the YAS Prize, um, but we still have the STOP Awards Initiative. Um, and uh, many of you will be getting your second level of YAS Prize and STOP Awards tonight. Um, the issue was we came up with these four words. We just kept coming up with them. What is it that we want to do? Well, education has to be sustainable, meaning it can survive past somebody handing you a check that is not the public. It should be publicly supported. It should be transformational. So, so many people um, are doing such good work, but how many of us, even those of us who innovate today, are taking it to the next level tomorrow? outstanding by whatever measure matters. You just talked a lot about that in the prior panels about how you actually measure success. And finally, as we've all been hearing today, one of our favorite words, permissionless. That you don't have to ask people for permission, and if you do, there's something really wrong with the law and you have to change it, right? So I've already given away the punchline, but I'm gonna start with Heidi True of West Virginia Academy. Heidi, which one of those is your favorite and why? I'd have to say, oh, let's see if this is on. All right, can you hear me better? There we go. I'd have to say permissionless. Um, being from West Virginia, it is a state that is notoriously um, stagnant. And I think the only way that we can change education for these kids is to take that effort, right? To change something, to do something permissionless because they haven't done it for a very long time. And I think in all of our realms and all of our areas, uh, there is that chance that you have to take to reach those co children that haven't been reached for a very long time. And Pastor Josh Robertson from the um, amazing Black Pastors Forum uh, in Rock Creek Church, what's your favorite and why? And it's okay if you repeat. Sure. I think my favorite is sustainable um, because I think with all of the creative genius that we have um, and the courage that we have to innovate, and our collaborative efforts, um, how can we sustain that? How can we make sure that our children and our children's children have access to education? So I think finding ways and business models that can uh, withstand the test of times, but then also being very intentional about advocating and making sure that we have educational freedom, that our laws reflect the values of education freedom and opportunity is vitally important. So I would say sustainability. All right, so from West Virginia to Pennsylvania to Wisconsin, Sean Luring Lumen, tell us about your favorite. Uh, transformational for sure. Uh, I think you can be outstanding and not necessarily transformational because we're talking about individual children and transforming for individuals. And as an organization, um, I think that also means not missing the forest for the trees. And I think we do that in education sometimes. Uh, and, and one of the forests that our kids need to be is meaningful, decent work. We need to get them to that as, as piece of it. So we're, uh, we're working on transforming our education to ensure that every child at the end has meaningful meaningful and decent work pathways. Incredible. And Elias Pappas, Odyssey Charter School, Delaware. We did actually plan that this is going to be five different states, but it was. You guys decided to be on this panel. Tell us about your favorite. Jeannie, I think, I think a lot has to do with uh, the way the four principles intertwine with each other. So instead of picking one, I'd rather say it's how we stop altogether. Uh, because absolutely we need to be sustainable 
Absolutely, we need to be transformational and outstanding and permissionless, but it's really, how do we really think about how we intertwine all of those values in such a way that all kids can find a successful pathway in our future, right? At Odyssey Charter School, uh, the only Greek school amongst you all, right? Uh, we're very proud to be able to take, kind of take that and really harness all those pieces of it in order to create that sustainability that we talked about. To create a permissionless forum, we're a tuitionless school, right? And that is a very important piece because we can touch a lot more kids that way and it, it becomes accessible to a lot more people. Of course, outstanding. And I resonated with so many people because there's so many ways to define outstanding. But one of the things that we want to do is we want to empower our kids in such ways that they would be able to work from within the system and supersede the system. So what I mean by that is, well, right now we have test scores that we have to deal with, so certainly we need to prepare our kids to be able to show at least in that forum so that we can continue to advocate for them while we're continuing to innovate as a group over here together. Right, and then thinking through, well, how do we make the financing work? A lot of us that are charter schools out here know very well that we are behind the gun because we don't get facilities funding. And at Odyssey Charter School, that means there's $3 million a year that we have to come up with on top of what other education systems have to come up with, which comes at, a, at quite a cost. And we've done it through our own innovations. We talk about bus transportation at Odyssey Charter School, which we, uh, which we have done it in an enterprise way, which allows us to get some of that money back and recover it. But really what, what I love about what I hear over here with everybody is that through these systems and through this innovation together, now we are a movement. And now we have a voice together. And now I have all of these friends in here that we can use to really shake up the system once and for all and help, and help liberate education for our students. We will definitely be counting on that. Thank you, Elias. Finally, last but not least, Mike Piscal, College Achievement Prep in New Jersey. Yes, yes uh, thank you. Um, my favorite would be, I, I think it's necessary. It, without this innovation, none of our work would be possible. And I think so often we get so into the work and finding best practices, but it's permissionless. If the revolution is parents choosing which school they send their child to, that is the revolution because that is bringing the market economy to public education. And public education in so many cities is utterly failing. When you have single digit college graduation rates from our major cities, in most areas of our major cities, that is a failed society. And so giving the parents the power of choice is creating the market economy. That's the only way this is going to work. And we got to get, we got to remember that work. And if we're not getting our parents into that fight, we're never going to, the revolution will fail. You know, and we, that's my, I don't know, it's my favorite, but it's the most necessary to our work. Well, and you just touched on, as many of you did, on this notion of equitable, equitable treatment. Uh, I don't want to say equity, it means too many different things to too many people, but equitable treatment, being treated equally among your peers. So, Sean, let me start with you in the middle because, because the very fundamental um, structures, like each of you, charter, private, micro slash charter, um, private, all of them depend on someone funding education, which is, I thought, a public good. But Sean, there is a group of people challenging the money that actually pays for your students to go to school in Wisconsin. So let's, in our few minutes and our final panel, let's let people out there know and understand what it is that you're up against in each of your states. Yeah, in, in medicine they have, you know, the Hippocratic Oath or so, I, I, I don't know it exactly except do I no can harm, verify right? that from Greek yeah, lines, yes. Yeah, okay, D do no harm. In education, we have um, the exact opposite, where adults harm kids every single day of the year. Um, and in Wisconsin, that's happening right now. There's literally an organization that, that wants to say to our kids, you are now expelled from those schools and you have to go to ones that you don't choose. Can you imagine a society where that is acceptable? That's Wisconsin right now. There's a group that's challenging uh, a 30-year-old a uh, voucher program where, where parents get to literally choose the school, private charter um, district, they get to choose the school and the money follows them. Um, um, it's one of the oldest established in the in, in the entire country, and um, this group is is working really hard to try to take that away by sur superseding most of the court system and going s directly. It's political move directly to the state supreme court. Um, so that is being looked at right now. 
And Josh, you've always been a fan of good schools, whether they're public, private, charter, and you started uh, your learning centers to help stem the tide of failure uh, in the local schools for the students in Harrisburg. But you don't get the additional funding that students get, and I think there's also a school choice program pending in Pennsylvania. What's, what are you up against? Why isn't that passing? Sure, sadly, um, last Sunday we had a town hall meeting where we had a senator and a state representative um, present there, and they both agreed um, that they should be passing the Lifeline Scholarship and the PASS program, and that the sole reason for them not passing that was because the Senate in the House, it was political. And that's what we're up against, right? That's, 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 a, that's a real and significant battle that we have to face. But I think how we face it is, I think most parents don't know the options that are available to them. And so I think that there, needs, there has to be a national movement of educating and advocacy um, where our parents can be informed as to the laws that govern education and then their voice is empowered and thereby being able to garner their votes. Because um, ultimately, we need to vote our way to, re, uh, to educational freedom. And I think we do it through the parents. Why I am uniquely, I think, positioned amongst us to serve is because in every single city that we represent, there's a cluster of churches there that our parents go to um, that have, uh, and that's how we get to critical mass. I think, how can we get to critical mass as far as voices and votes, I think is how we challenge the current apparatus uh, that, that keeps education, I think, limited. And, I, and if I can say one more thing, it just shocks me that in this country that was built off of courage, creativity, and a collaborative spirit, that we don't use those three virtues to create equity amongst equals. And I think us as, as education providers and people, we gotta fight. We gotta fight for the voices and the votes that can secure our future together. Well said. Uh, Elias, you uh, did something really incredibly innovative. I mean, you decided to run your own bus company and also contract out with other districts to be able to subsidize what you do, but should we have to make a school do that? Well, one of the ways that we can help in the future is obviously by showing individuals that we're responsible with our money and we take that seriously and especially what I appreciate so much about the the Yas Prize and the foundation and all of the people that are in this room is that we put our money where our mouth is and we we take we respect the money that comes to us in such a way that we can get the most outcomes for our kids and that's what we're hearing in this room today uh, should we have to do it absolutely not all students should be able have a right to a free and public education in this country, and all students have a right to a high quality education in this country. It's shameful that we are in a position where we have to come up with this level of in ingenuity and innovation for us to push forward. Uh, it isn't to say that we, are, we don't have the people in the room to be able to do it, but it's just a darn shame that we're like that, and it's a darn shame that our political systems at the local level, might I add, because that is where it is the most corrupt, are not allowing for us to be able to move initiatives forward and allow for parents to have that final choice of what is best for their children in their education. And that to me is why we have institutions like the ones we have over here where we teach civics engagement immediately from a young age so all our students understand, oh, you absolutely can see the general generational change that you're looking for because we're gonna uplift you and we're gonna teach you how to go advocate and then we can uplift these communities once and for all. You know, everyone in this room and so many and, and our 64 quarter finalists prior and, and past cohorts and so many people that even didn't make it to that level um, have ha come to this with so many different backgrounds and sectors and they've, they've left other jobs to go into education. They've developed their own programs and innovations and they've all come up against this, again, no matter what area they're coming from, Mike, I was very happy that consistently your organization was judged high, so I didn't have to recuse myself from final judging because I've known you for about 25 years. And when I met you, you were running around LA um, trying to get people to understand why the students in South Central LA should have an option to go to your original schools. And then you um, came east 
and went to your uh, home state, if you will, to open something up. What's the change you've seen over time in a couple of minutes um, that uh, you think is better and what's not better? Um, I think, you know, I've learned a lot and from my experiences and, and what to spend less time on and what's more critically important. I, I do think there's, um, I, I think, again, reaching the parents and motivating the parents. The parents, if they don't know they have this ability and this freedom, th they can't escape <laughs> their, their local public school. And that, I thought that was electric in LA and it's not a, as electric in New Jersey. The parents don't realize that they have a choice and the choice will be transformational. What their kids, we, we're trying to create a school that I wish, that I think all of you wish you went to one of my schools. You get to go to college for two weeks in the summer, whether it be at Princeton or Europe, uh, and you get to look at the world in a different place. We have a lot of kids that live in public housing, and for them to go and live on Princeton's campus for two weeks in the dorm and be taught by Princeton professors, they come back, and then our teachers love teaching there because the kids are now so incredibly motivated. You don't have to like become this psychological genius to teach at our schools to motivate the kids. So we've set up these systems and programs that unlock that, and I think I've learned so much more about the social capital part of how to inspire our kids. And now I, I gotta figure out how to inspire the parents um, for the revolution. For the revolution. So Heidi, speaking of revolutions, bring us home, help us close out. Um, how do we encourage, motivate, and adopt this notion of every, everyone, every policymaker should stop for education? I think the biggest thing is um, putting your voice out there, being heard. Uh, telling your story again and again. The one thing that I've noticed is a lot of people, when I say I'm from West Virginia, they think I'm from Western Virginia. There are states and areas like the Delta, things like that, that are not being seen. And I think getting the voice out there and being able to lift back that curtain and say, all right, what's going on back there? What's going on in educational systems? I think we have been eye-opened and shocked when we actually look at uh, the bureaucratic nation, you know, the, the bureaucracy that they've created in, the, in districts and in high-level um, educational spaces and getting the word out to the legislators and saying, this is what's going on, did you realize this? And a lot of them have no idea. And so that's what's the key to it, is getting the word out and spreading as much as you can. I think that's the biggest. So we've heard from 33 people today, and that um, if you hadn't watched the whole thing, we would urge you to go back and watch it. It is truly extraordinary to hear the views and the passion and dedication of all of you. And what you've learned, so many of you out there thought you just sort of start something and get stuff done and you'd be fine, you could go back to, I don't know, shopping for Christmas on time. And no, it doesn't happen, right? or Hanukkah, whatever. Um, and so we are so grateful that you're in this room. Um, hopefully this has given everybody a little bird's eye view into what real revolutionary, sustainable, transformational, outstanding, permissionless education is and why it's so critical. And in just a few short hours, you all will be joining us um, to uh, celebrate you um, and to talk about the next level and the next steps um, and the next ascent uh, into the Yas Prize movement and community. So thank you for being part of the Yas Prize movement. Thank you for putting yourself out there. Thank you, those of you watching it. Please follow on Twitter tonight, starting around 8.45 for big announcements. Um, and until then, um, we will see you around. Thank you all for being here. Thank you.